I'm delighted and excited to be here with you with close to thousands of experts, Rabbonim, Kalda teachers, therapists, and counselors from all over the world. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for participating, for giving me the opportunity to share the knowledge that we have gained from medical conferences from all over the world, and especially in the last year. The conferences that we focused was the conferences who brought the biggest and the latest innovation. Before we going into the updates, the medical updates in the next hour and a half, we just want to set the platform. So tonight, or by you in the morning, wherever you are, from Australia to the States, from UK to Israel, we will focus on a lot of medical innovations in the style of a TED talk, which means there'll be questions and answers only by text, but Q and A that you can put in questions. I'm going to answer all the questions only after we'll finish the talk. I will stay with you for all your questions, but it's going to be after the talk. So as we're going to speak, we'll go quickly over a lot of updates, a lot of insights, and the focus will be to cover as many topics and updates possible. With your permission, I would like to introduce the reason why we're here today. And the reason is that so many couples suffer and struggle in silence. You as experts, as medical experts, as college teachers, as Rabbonim, and leaders in the community, you all make an impact every day of so many families. There's no need to convince you. All of you can tell us how many couples really struggle in their marriage. Medical challenges are coming up every day. Every couple has sometimes in life to have new struggles. One of the new challenges in medicine, in modern medicine, is that since we have so many innovations, people get confused. They don't know what to choose. We need you as experts to come up with a plan and say, this innovation is suitable for you. The others are not suitable for you. Yes, you may have heard this from friends, from the news, or from others, you're educated, but the idea is that it should be personalized medicine. So tonight, today, we want to share with you a lot of Tarenu experience, not just from the innovation, but also how we are personalizing this. So you can use this for you patients, as rabbis in the community, as doctors, as nurses, and experts. The main problem that young couples and older couples are struggling is today more than before. We'll see soon why today there are so many new challenges. But on the other hand, thanks God, Baruch Hashem, there are so many new solutions. The bottom line is, and this is a take-home message, that medicine is today dynamic in a super fast level. Every single month, our medical conferences with new medications, new guidelines, new research, new technologies, new therapies, and if we are not keeping up, we're not going to give our best to our patients, to our communities. Tarenu's goal and mission is that you, all of you, community leaders, should be at your best with the latest tools, the most advanced tools, so you can help on a better level. Yes, you can do better. You as a leader have the obligation and schus to do the best for your couples, for your families. And we're going to show you tonight, today, that every one of you can make a much better job by using the better tools, latest tools available. It's available everywhere in the world. Most of the information is available everywhere. Tyrannus' mission is to make sure that no couple is suffering in silence anymore. Thank you for all of you for joining the movement of Tarenu to empower couples and to empower women, to help them have more Tahara Samishpocha, have them help them have more Taharenu, more Tahara in a happy way. Help them bring in more Nishumas to the world. Help them build their families in an easier way, in a quicker way, and in more halucha, an ideal way. Yes, also in a cheaper way, as we will see soon. The way we do this in Tarenu, and we welcome you to join us, is by not only updating once a year, as this meeting is today, but also rather to invite you to be a part of the Tarenu movement every month. We have our newsletter. The newsletter is a summary of medical conferences from this month. Every month, we do join medical conferences physically and digitally. And we summarize that in the newsletter as highlights. So we would like to ask you, please join us. Sign up for the newsletter. Have your colleagues and your friends, experts and leaders in the community to sign up. Get a free service. 
Not only that, of course, we have the Tyreno hotline service, which is available for the public as well. People can call in, people get the full information. This is the end customer service. However, I would like to highlight that at the end of the talk today, we're going to present a new project, which is taking the leaders in the communities and make them for experts, take them to the next level. So this is something which we'll discuss at the end of the talk of a new course, a very updated course, which will take place next week, will take for the next couple of months. So we're going to with this to start. Thank you so much. The topics today we'll cover is it will include the AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding. One of the main topics of Tahar Samishpocha is called today in the medical language, AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding. Thanks God that this is today recognized as a medical issue. So we can actually treat people medically and effectively with very new solutions as we will discuss soon. One of the other topics is the progesterone. I have to highlight one of the causes of the main problems of Tahar Samishpocha, of AUB, is due to hormonal issues. Hormonal issues is due to taking estrogen and progesterone, or just progesterone, mainly progesterone, as we will see. But what's interesting to learn today is that we actually treat a lot of the challenges with AUB with using different types of progesterone. So the same troublemaker can turn into a solution. The progesterone can be a cause of problems. It can actually be bringing and giving us the solutions. It depends on the dosages and the timing and the type and the way, the methods. You will see all the details very soon. Male fertility and, fertil and female fertility, some very important medical updates to help couples who struggle with infertility. The same with the topic of RPL, recurrent pregnancy loss, couples who struggle to build a family because of the challenge of miscarriages. Many new updates in the field. Contraception is, of course, one of the leading causes of AUB challenges. When we talk about birth control issues, and as we will discuss soon, contraception has a lot of details that if we know how to choose right, and with the new innovations in contraception, we can help so many more couples continue with the shulam bias, continue with the Taharas HaMishpucha without stress. Of course, contraception is only with their local rabbi's Pesach, who gives them the guidance when to use. PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing, is a technology available for a couple of years, but we would like to share today. Okay, we are back. Thank you so much for your patience. Appreciate that. And uh, here we go. So let's summarize what I just started to say that you as leaders in the community have the schosen obligation to help every couple who suffers in silence. And doing so with the latest tools will help the couples, will help you. Our mission in Tarrain is really to bring the latest in the field. And we like to offer the services by our newsletter. We want you all to sign up and your colleagues on our monthly newsletter when we bring together all the latest updates. And as well, to use our services in the hotline. And lately, the latest will speak after this session about our training services that we have that every one of you, as a leader in the community, as a doctor, as a nurse, as a rabbi, can be trained in with the latest information that we have in Tarenu, also from the medical perspective, also from the local perspective, and mainly from our practical perspective, dealing every day with hundreds of couples. So how we all package it to empower and to educate couples so we all can join this movement of bringing simcha to couples and stop the suffering and in silence in the couples. So with this, we're going to start and going through very quickly a lot of medical updates. And I want to please all the questions be only in the Q&A. So when we finish this talk, we will respond to all the questions only from Q&A. Thank you so much. As mentioned, and you see in the slide, the, the main updates are from the ACOC, which was lately in San Diego, the biggest conference in the world of gynecology, as well from the ASRM in Baltimore. They had a chance to be this year. Thanks God. So this was two conferences that had a chance to be physically in the States, listening, meeting doctors and companies, speaking to the people in life. And this is what I want to share with you. As well, of course, many, many other conferences that we had a chance to participate. And we summarize it for you on the topics of Tahara, AUB, or the progesterones. We're going to cover a lot of updates. Fertility, male and female, miscarriages, recurrent pregnancy loss, 
and contraception, which we know are one of the biggest challenges today with the Tahara, with the bleeding and staining issues is due to the contraception. So we will discuss some new latest in the field and some solutions. As well, we wanna touch on the PGT, the latest updates regarding PGTP. So with this, I'm gonna go into that, to the medical updates. So the first topic we would like to focus today is the contraception. Now, if I would ask any rabbi, any doctor in our community of Adeka Sahara, or nurse, why are we struggling so much with Tahara's Mishpucha today? Every single woman has challenges. So of course we have more challenges than it was before. We did not, never had so many women having so much staining, stress, and challenges with this. One of the main causes is because we have today what we call the contraceptions, hormonal or IUDs, they all cause us problems. They all cause us problems. Okay, I just want to double check everyone is okay and can listen, can hear me. If not, let me know. Please, if someone can reassure me that, you know, you hear me. Great. Okay, yes. Thank you for coming in. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the contraceptions is a field which in the last 70 years was developed with many, many changes. Just to get the idea that we have today over 200 pills in the world, over 200 different types of pills, we can understand it's very complex. So we know, yes, if we take the wrong thing for the wrong woman, we might have a lot of challenges with Tahara's Mishpocha. So the focus is really to try to have the education beforehand, before they choose, you as a doctor or an expert or a rabbi, to educate the people, not just to guide them to use. Of course, this is the rabbi's job to give the heter and the halacha perspective, and the doctors, the medical, from the medical perspective, the need of it. But what to use is, is sometimes more important, the, 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 the way how we choose it, how we're going to go regarding Tahara. So I want to focus now is some of the updates to know what we have in the last two years. Okay, the last two years, we got at least five major updates. Just one second. Okay, um, I wonder if now it's better. Please fill me in. Some people asked to make it a little bit bigger. Let me know if this is the way you want it. The screen, is it enough clear? We're going to continue. Please, if someone can uh, approve that we can see everything. Perfect. Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, wonderful. So here we go. So we're talking about five medical updates. And these five medical updates, as we see here, is going to be a lot of them are hormones, and some of them are not hormones. The slint. The slint is the first thing that we're going to start because the slint is the type of pill that we would like to recommend that every woman, if she lives in a country like in the States or in most countries in Europe, in Australia, that we have available already the slint or in Australia, Slinda. So it's the ideal pill, the least problems with Tahara Samishpucha, but not only that is beneficial for the Tahara perspective, but as we will see, has a lot of other benefits as well. And I want to discuss this in a minute because in Tahara, in the last two and a half years or so, we had a chance to recommend and educate people about the slint and getting tremendous amount of positive feedback. To understand what is the difference between the slint, slint is first of all, a mini pill. It's a regular mini pill, which has only progesterone, no estrogen. However, one of the main differences between the slint to the other mini pills is that the slint has a new type of progesterone. It's similar, the same actually like the Yaz. Okay, so with this progesterone that we have in the slint, having it in a high dosage, it's almost like three times the dosage like a regular mini pill, but it works in a method mechanism that it suppresses the ovulation versus regular mini pills that a main mechanism is not by suppressing ovulation, here we have a mini pill, which works like a combination pill, the same effective, and therefore we have less staining. And even if it's a little bit late, for many people but the mini pill have an issue to take it on time. But even if they do take it on time, they have a lot of challenges. We know that mini pill is probably of the biggest problems in Tahara when it comes to the contraception. Over 60% reported in research have irregular cycles or breakthroughs or stainings with the mini pill. With the slint, it gets down to less than 5%. It's really to minimize the problems with the Harris and Mishpuch by using slint. 
Plus, on top of that, we have a major other benefit that this lint is suitable and very much beneficial for people who like to have emotional well-being. The regular mini pills cause a challenge. The lint is actually a solution. And even people with postpartum depression can speak to their doctors and experts that this lint should be the treatment for depression, for challenges and anxiety, because the type of progesterone that this lint is using is an excellent progesterone suitable for this type of challenges. So with this, we know that this lint, yes, it is without estrogen. So people in one hand like to take estrogen if they want to be more effective. It's true that the regular... It's true that regular mini pills, the regular mini pills do not have the same effectiveness if a woman is not nursing. However, the slint does have very much the same effectiveness rate by research just published now, the latest ACA conference, that we can use it even if women are not pregnant and it will be the same effective. Let's continue. And just finishing up to say that in countries like in Israel, that we don't have the slint, we do not have a solution, nothing similar at the moment. So we can definitely, we can definitely focus on the slint at the moment in countries that they have it. And other countries, of course, with telemedicine today, not a, such a big deal to get it. The other innovation that is available already the last two, three years, that is the Anavera. Anavera is very similar to the new ring. The only difference is that it's for the full year. Instead of every month to change a new ring, we have one ring for the full year. There is also some changes in the hormones. Therefore, if someone wants to use a new ring and had bad experience, definitely can try to use the Anavera and it might be the right solution. How long can a person connect the Anavera? In the last conference with ACOT, they presented that they would like to give it usually for three, four months, not more for that, not because we have research, it's a problem to connect longer, just because most people will have breakthroughs if they go longer. The next topic is the Twirla. Twirla, as you see, this is a patch, very similar to the Evera that was available for many years. However, the difference is that Twirla, I spoke to the company and they explained me the reason why the Twirla does not have a problem in the summer or when the, the corner picks up from the sticker, it's because the technology is that, as you see the letters in the sticker, this is where the hormones is getting released. It's not a full sticker has the hormones like the Evera. So whenever the corner was picking up, there was no more release of hormones and that causes staining because it wasn't the balance and the full potential of the hormones to be released. However, in this case, it's more effective, less staining issues. Going to the Faxi, which is a non-hormonal method. This is not a 100% method. You need to be careful, of course, because it's only something we can use when we don't need the full protection or when someone is combining with something else. Yes, there's aluha implications as well. Not every rabbi is happy to use these type of, of issues of uh, methods. However, just to mention, it's super expensive and it's about 86 to 90% effectiveness rate. In the last conference of the ACOG, they presented that the effectivity is only 86% uh, uh, effective. The difference between the FACSI to the old methods is just it works in a different mechanism. Here it's focusing on the vagina's pH. Going to the one of the highlights of the latest innovation in the contraception field, that is without any doubt the Nextelis. Nextelis is a pill, combination pill, which has a new type of estrogen. And after 50 years, after so many years, again, 50 years, we did not have a new complete new type of estrogen. Now, finally, we got a new type of estrogen, much more healthier, okay? Much more healthier, and therefore, many more doctors and providers prefer to use today the Nextelis because of the beneficial benefits of the estrogen that we have in this pill. So this is a combination pill, and we know that up till now, and many women with medical conditions could not couldn't use a combination pill. Now with Nextelis, everyone should recheck with their doctors because this estrogen is actually suiting for a lot of people, even with medical conditions. Of course, it has also benefits what they claim with the Tahar's Mishpucha, with the staining issue, much less problems. Without going into the details of the differences of this estrogen, it is a healthier estrogen. It is looks like that is the future of contraception and many other new medications by using this type of estrogen. Now, what is in the pipeline, which we don't have yet, but it's supposed to be available in the next year to two years. So our focus at the moment with this slide is in the States, eventually everywhere. But this is a new type of IUD. 
And as you can see here, the level sept, if I pronounce it right, this is it was presented by the ACA conference. And as you can see here, these pictures, this is a copper IUD, a copper IUD, but in a much, what do you call it, a smaller and much less copper. They believe the body will fight much less against this device, and therefore there will be less side effects, less bleeding, and in general less side effects. So this is not yet available in the market. It is approved. It's in the, in the whatever it's in the phase three trial, which means it's about to be approved, hopefully. And it looks like a lot of people will be able to benefit from this new type of I, copper IUD without the hormones and without the side effects that we know that the copper IUDs at the moment are challenging so many women. Here we have. A other new type of contraception, which is again, is suppository, it's not hormonal, not yet available. This is the OUI. The OUI is basically going to be different than the VCF or the other sperm sites by number one, working in one minute. And one of the problems with the VCF and all the sperm sites is that even if the potential use effectiveness is close to 90%, but in the practical use, it's less than 80% because people don't and they cannot be so careful less than 15 uh, to wait 15 minutes. And so having a method which is going to be in one minute might actually be very, very effective. Okay, so please, all the questions from chat, put it in Q&A. I'll be focused after I finish the talk to come and to respond to every question. So the OUA works a little bit similar to the FACC, so it might be preferable by some rabonim, and it's from the local perspective. It's not really killing the sperm. It's just blocking the movement. However, again, it's not probably going to be 100%. We don't know yet. It's not available. There's no research yet out the number of the effectiveness rate, but we can assume it's not going to be the ideal, but we're going to wait and of course update once we have it. So with this, let's continue. One second. Okay, now we're getting to the very exciting part of this talk. And this is the really big revolution which happened in the last generation, the last decade, the 10 years that uh, we have now a classification called palm coin. This is a recognition of the medical field, medical professional world who recognize the topic of staining and irregular bleeding as a medical issue, not as a problem, but we know it's a symptom of something. Therefore, if we can do the homework, investigation, we can get to the bottom of things. And when we focus to the bottom to fix the issue, we can actually gain that this woman will not suffer anymore with Tahara's Mishpoka challenges. Okay, so here is the really big breakthrough in medicine, because since the last 10 years, 2011, in fact, when the palm coin classification was published, it was adopted immediately by all the international societies. And therefore, now we have so much more research, so much more medications, so many more guidelines, and as you see here, the palm coin is just giving us ideas where to focus. The palm coin are two groups of problems. One is the structural causes, one is the non-structural. Palm is P-A-L-M. As you see, it's P for the palm, adenomyosis, limioma, and malignancy is the same thing when we talk about the non-structural issues. Every letter is standing for some issues. However, the most important letter in this page is the N, the not otherwise classified, because as we're going to see, this is today the biggest group, which was in the past not classified because when they came out with this research, they did not have yet enough data. But now we know that, yes, the problems is solved by having the, the, the causes. And we see here that in this group, we have another 10 causes. You see here 10 different causes, which is included and not otherwise classified, including endometriosis, including adhesions, and the Eshelman syndrome, the niche, and the retained product of conception, leftovers after miscarriages and after giving birth, and atropian, and so on. So what is the real big deal with having this model? It's that all of us as experts, if it's rabbis or doctors and everything in between, we can communicate with each other. We can actually know to get to the bottom of the problems, not just to push through every month. And this is very important, of course, that we know to focus on the problem, not just to say mutter, usr, but just to say, take this vitamin or just to go to the nurse. The nurse cannot look into the uterus. We need doctors to look into with different tools as we're going to see. One of the good things, as you can see here, is we had one of the topics in the model, which was the limayoma. And this is fibroid. Look what happened. We are a couple of years later. All of a sudden, we have a big challenge. And that was a major challenge because the fibroids were in charge of about 35% or more 
of the reasons why people do, did hysterectomy. And that was due to the fibroids, because fibroids, especially an older woman, older at the age of 40, so many suffered with major heavy bleeding with no solution. In the last couple of years, we had different solutions by three, four different types of operations. It was still minimally invasive gynecology, newer operations, and you can see here in this slide also the newest procedure. However, we still did not have medications to solve such a major problem. In the last year, as you can see here, we have available now, not only in the States, but in many countries, this med new medications, which works on the GNRH. My February and the Orion, they both have inside the elagalics or relagalics, which means it stops the GNRH in the brain, not releasing any more this hormone. Plus it has also estrogen and progesterone. It's a very similar medication that we have already a couple of years, close to four years for the endometriosis, the Oralisa, which is also having a GNRH agent stopping the GNRH release, but in this one is with the license for fibroids, and it has also estrogen and progesterone, therefore most side effects that we had without it, will, when we don't have this, will not, woman will not experience by using this. So this is a very good new medication to try for fibroids, and it's available. Again, this is a major revolution to stop the heavy bleeding. People can make hepsic higher in time. All of a sudden, if they don't have so much bleeding, they can have so many more clean days, and of course, with benefiting, not to have to do major operations, or not to go through under the hysterectomy, which of course is not easy from the practical level and not even from the halucha perspective, which is of course serious, which means it's not ideal as it says in Shulchan Aruch. Yes, it's maybe only the Rabbonan, not the Isidoraisa, so when there's a major need, maybe a Rosh can give a header. <clears throat> Although some place can hold it is Isidoraisa, needs to be Pekoach Nefesh to do hysterectomy, but it was definitely not ideal. Here we have new solutions to solve this problem without compromising the halukha. So I will just finish up this slide by mentioning there is one case that it's important to say that a new latest information supports to do hysterectomy. That is by women who have BRCA, BRCA1, BRCA2. We know today there is a debate in medicine if we should also remove always the uterus or it's enough to remove the ovaries. But we can share with you that one of the conferences in the last couple of months that I had a chance to listen into to be physical there in the conference, speak to doctors about this topic. Many experts believe that we can save lives if the women who are BRCA1 and 2, after they finish and they have already the family and they take out, and they do the procedure to take out the ovaries to save their lives, they should also remove, to remove the, ovary, the, the uterus as well. But in general, women would just, for the purpose of, when they have only challenges of fibroids, we absolutely should try to solve the problems of Tahara with medications, and with the procedures before we go for this practice. Now, I wanna share with you one of the interesting insights that we can see here in this slide, in the next couple of slides. When we talk about Taharas and Mishpucha, and people always ask what happened when Taharenu put Taharas and Mishpucha as a medical problem. Now, number one, as we just mentioned, it's things got in the medical field recognized the same time 10 years ago, 11 years ago when Taharenu started, the same time, Hashem gave us the knowledge in the medical field also, also not, recognize this is a major issue. But why? Why is it so, so obvious, so common that so many women, in fact, probably every woman in one stage in life or another will struggle in one level or another with challenges of Taharas Mishpocha, staining, bleeding, irregular cycles. But there are many explanations. One of them is definitely the medications. We mentioned contraception. Yes, contraception is also one of them. But I want to highlight now and put the real focus on the progesterone hormone. Progesterone hormone is a very interesting hormone because as you can see here, progesterone is related to the cycle, to the staining issues. It can make staining, it can make irregular cycles. And when we look at the clinical implications, we will see that we are actually using progesterone to treat almost everything in life. We use it to treat pregnancies. We need progesterone for the pregnancy, fertility treatments, contraception, HRTs, MHTs, we use it everywhere. Miscarriages, RPL, when not, almost every second medication in reproductive medicine is involving progesterone. So this is really contra, you know, it's very interesting. It's on one hand, the pr troublemaker, on one hand, this is actually something that we cannot with it, we cannot without it. It's also bringing us the biggest solutions. So when, when I wanna focus on progesterone, my take home message, is going to be now for the next couple of slides that even if you know you're recommending or prescribing 
to a woman progesterone. You know, we have to be very careful to educate them the differences. Unfortunately, many rabbonim and many doctors and nurses are not so sensitive and not so maybe educated of the differences between the types of progesterones, the dosages of progesterones, the methods, how we use it, when to use it, when to start. All of this will make it or break it. Can be the cause of the problem or can be the solution. So we can see in this slide, it's a very busy slide, but we can see one thing. We need the progesterone all the time in a woman's life. And the Taharis Mishpocha, without progesterone, will be a mess, will be a lot of staining. With the progesterone, that can help us a lot. How do we manage? So let's discuss that. As we see here in this slide, when we talk about progesterones, the first thing is to recognize we have many different generations of progesterones. So here we see four different generations. There are more today, more different types of progesterones. So understanding that when we say, or there's a medical recommendation that we should use progesterone, not every progesterone, because it has the name progesterone, will do the same job. We need to be careful what type of progesterone we're going to choose. Then we see also in this slide that we need to be careful what method we're going to use. Is it going to be a dispository? Is it going to be injection or a pill? It makes a huge difference. And of course, at the end of the day, we need to know the dosages. What dosage we're going to use. So let's see a little bit more, more details about the different types of progesterones, the different methods of progesterones, and different dosages of progesterones. For all of you who are doctors, nurses, and experts, medical experts, this is really la lucha la maison. So you can use this information. Of course, you can look it up. Nothing is our information. It's just our knowledge that we put together, and of course, our experience and the feedback that we got in Tarenu. But even you as rabbis, chusen teachers, and college teachers, trust me, you need to know this information. You can make a difference in the lives of people if you educate them with this. So here we go. When we talk about a woman who is just about pregnant and has some staining, we will see soon the latest research that is published now from the UK in the last month, tremendous amount of research to prove without any question, any debate anymore, that progesterone will prevent miscarriages. Giving progesterone for a woman who has staining or bleeding in the first trimester, specifically, especially if she was in her hair experience, unfortunately, she had a miscarriage which started with bleeding, giving her now progesterone and the next time when she's pregnant, even before she is bleeding, that will save the pregnancy. However, we need to be careful what type of progesterone. You see in this slide a lot of different types of progesterones, different companies, different brands, and different countries, different names, but it's also different types of progesterones. So when we talk about pregnant woman, we'll see soon what type of progesterone we need to choose. And that is going to be also depending which country you are. If you are in the States, that is one type. If you are in Europe or in Israel, it's a different type. In this case, we don't have yet in the States the best type of progesterone. The best progesterone to support pregnancy is digesterone, which is the company Dufuston. Not yet available in the States. But in the meantime, we can use others. Now, let's focus a little bit about contraception. As you see here, a lot of different brands of, of progesterones, we just mentioned before, with the new one, the Slint. So yes, it makes a difference. As just explained before, the different type of progesterone in the Slint will make it, it make a huge difference. Now look about the norcisterone, which is the agestin. Usually we don't use this as a contraception, but we use this a, to solve the problem. You have one progesterone, which is the regular Cerazet, regular mini pills, which makes the most problems. One of the solutions doctors will give is actually to add a different type of progesterone. It's two types of progesterone, and together they can actually be very successful with preventing any staining. Even further, every color or anyone who needs to control the cycle, either for vacation reasons or whenever they need to push up a cycle, we know that one of the best ways to, to do this is if they just do it for one month, is with using the HSN in the States or norcystrin. The same thing, or primalidorin in Europe and other countries, it's exactly the same type of progesterone, the agestin in the States, again, with norocisterone and primalidorin in Europe. So this type of progesterone can work. We need to know the timing when to start, not to start to use it before ovulation and not less than seven days. Yes, if someone has no choice, she's already going on vacation less than seven days, well, we can still try it. But ideally, we want to start seven days before she is expecting a period. What dosage to use? Yes, the same issue. Some doctors will just going to give five. We usually give 10, right? In most places in the world. However, in most countries in Europe, the guidelines is to give 15. Okay, so it comes usually five milligram, 
and in Europe, they give 15. So in the States, yes, we can go with 10, but if someone is really very important for them to push up like Khalas, or when they're pushing up more than two weeks after they were supposed to get the period, then they should probably consider to use 15, or at least when they start with the staining, to stop it right away. Of course, everything only with the permission of their doctor, because this is not over the counter. And this slide is important to highlight. One of the latest updates from the conference in the ACOG, where they announced that the FDA is about to approve this year, the same as the English in the UK already did a year ago, and that is to take all the mini pills and put it over the counter. So we're going to have actually now a new generation, a new situation where women can actually be educated by doctors, by experts, how to use the mini pill, go in, in the pharmacy, just buy themselves the mini pill. It's already happening in the UK and it's very successful. The same thing is about to happen now in the States. So it's super important for us as educators to explain people because this mini pill, again, on one hand, if you give it for the woman to buy it themselves with our doctors, can be on one hand, unfortunately, making more problems from Taras Mishpocha, People will buy them, not going to know what the basic information is. So it's even getting more important that you as a rabbi, as a nurse, as a college teacher, whoever teacher, whoever comes back to you, just educate them. The three main points, be careful, take it at the same time every single day. If it's not helpful, they're staining, they should get permission maybe with a doctor to use two a day. And number three, as mentioned before, there are other better maybe mini pills, which the slint, I'm not sure the slint will be immediately over the counter. So they should definitely know that there is differences between the different types. Okay, so as you see here, we have different types of progesterones. We mentioned the contraception. We mentioned something about pregnant women. How about women who are not pregnant and they are want to push up the period? They don't know, not colors. They want to do cycle control. They don't know if they're pregnant or not. So some doctors are not familiar. And they're not sure if we can use the type of the agestin to push up the next period when there is a chance that this woman is maybe pregnant. So first of all, I want to fill you in. We check this with many experts. In different hospitals, doctors who specialize, they made the research, it's clear there's no problem to take this mini pill, sorry, this progesterone, the agestin, and to take it, let's say, from day 20 in a cycle after ovulation and to try to push up the period, even if there is a chance, even if it could be she is pregnant. There's no problem. This cannot make a miscarriage. And we understand that, of course, once she is ready to get a period, she can either just stop the, the medication if she wants to know if she's pregnant, she can make over-the-counter or a blood test to know if she's pregnant. There's no, if, no problem to continue even if she is pregnant. It's not ideal, but it's no causing any problem. Some doctors, though, because they're not familiar with this information, they give the Provera. It's a different type of progesterone. It's not the same powerful like agestin. It's important to know. Yes, doctors using it, and it's probably a very ideal medication for a woman over the age of 40, 45, when they have a maybe an issue with agestin, like in the UK and other countries, who are not happy to use by the guidelines anymore, the agestin, so then we can use the Provera because it's a better type of progesterone for that age. However, when we talk about a young woman from 20 to 40, the agestin is definitely by far more powerful. That should be the ideal in order to prevent the staining and the Taras Mishpocha challenges. As we see here, when we talk about more progesterones who make problems, of course, some of them include the IUDs. We have today six types of IUDs, not only the Marina, but we have already for quite a few years. But today, in the last couple of years, we have many more types of IUDs, smaller by size, less hormones, more hormones. There's no more hormones than Marina, but less hormones are the same hormones, different sizes, and so on. But the bottom line is that this type of contraception, IUD with the Marina, we need to be aware in order to help women with the, with the staining that number one, that over 60% of women will have challenges in the first three to six months. And if the woman is not ready to take this challenge, most women will not be ready to take it, this challenge. They should rather not use it. Of course, if they need something for long term or other benefits, this is still a method that we use, especially for older women over the age of 40. But for young women, specifically in the ages of the 20s and even in the young 30s, we usually recommend not to use this because there are so many other better solutions without going through this challenge of so many months of issues of staining. However, the problem, one of the issues why it's so, so many staining issues with the IUD, it is because of the progesterone. And therefore, the solutions, it is doable by managing either if it's very thin lining to add a little bit of estrogen or a different type of progesterone like HSN, we can manage many times to go through it. If a woman for some reason decided to go with this, we can manage it. Of course, there's other medications as well. We will speak soon how to manage people who do have stainings due to progesterone. 
Dapiprovera, which is the injection, or we have also implants. Again, everything is progesterone. And it is the problem that progesterone is making. The lining gets very thin, not stable. There's no estrogen to support one hand, and it is breaking off. And there, there, therefore, so many women have these problems with the stainings and the breakthroughs. We try in Tarvena, we recommend in general not to use Dapiprovera. It's got to be a very specific reason why a woman should be actually having this, pro this products of the hormonal IDs or injections or implants. Infertility, I'm not going to go into too much in details, but everyone knows that infertility is based on progesterone. Once a woman has done a IVF, she needs the hormonal support. You cannot go without progesterone. Just, of course, to understand why doctors are combining different progesterones, not only one progesterone, and yes, the dosages makes a difference. The type of progesterone makes a difference. But a woman is, after infertility treatments with bleeding, it's crucial to go back to the doctor. Maybe there's a different protocol that she needs to use in order to stay with the pregnancy, not to lose the pregnancy. So we know and we understand the, the progesterone is very important for the fertilization, mostly for the implantation, but also for the pregnancy to keep up the pregnancy. So yes, infertility is a very big part of that challenge and solution from progesterone. Here we go regarding miscarriages of RPL. As you see here, the group of Tommies, which is really the biggest group in the UK, one of the leading groups in the world of research in the last 20 years of miscarriages, they just published. And I listened to this conference just a month and a half ago, and this was unbelievable data. that They presented very clear, very sharp data. And, and we'll start with this punchline. What they presented is that 8,450 miscarriages could be prevented each year in the UK. if we will give them progesterone in the first trimester. So yes, for decades, doctors all over the world have this debate, should we give progesterone, should we not? Is there any harm? So first of all, we know by research in the last decade, there's no harm. A woman who is pregnant can only benefit with using progesterone. There's no harm by using progesterone. So if we talk about a woman who has never had a miscarriage, never experienced any bleeding, so yes, I'm not sure we need to recommend to give progesterone. What we're talking now is about a woman who had a miscarriage in the past, or she has at the moment a threatened miscarriage. And we want to stop the bleeding in the early pregnancy. The way to stop the bleeding will be only by one medication, and that is progesterone. There's no other medication that can stop bleeding that a pregnant woman. But again, the really take home message from this research of the Tommy's group is that we can prevent miscarriages. Think about it, how painful every miscarriage is. We used to say that every miscarriage is due most the vast majority genetic problems. Could be that when we check the genetics, we see that there is a problem in genetics, but could be that it would be self-correction. We know today by research, there is such a concept of self-correction, but maybe the, mis the miscarriage happened because there was actually a lack of progesterone. And here's another interesting insight that there's no point to measure progesterone in a pregnant woman because it's fluctuating all the time, up and down, and we have no idea what her real levels is. So all we need to do is if someone has bleeding and miscarriage in, in, a, in a, a pregnancy, or she had in the past a miscarriage and bleeding, and even a general miscarriage in the first trimester, we need to take progesterone for the, at least for the first, uh, first 12 weeks. And their research in England, they went for up to 16 weeks or a group of 25 weeks. So there are different numbers in general in the States and most places in the world, we give it up to 12 weeks. And this is super effective then, as you see here, the support of the research published in 2018. Now, which type of progesterone will make here a huge difference? And a lot of experts are not so familiar with the differences of the, the, the progesterone and they get, just give them because they hear it or, or read somewhere that it, there's a benefit from the progesterone. The only progesterone that can help is the micronized progesterone and only if it's given as a dispository. So it needs to be micronized progesterone given as a dispository. The dosage is the 400. That is in the States. Countries like in Israel or in Belgium, many countries in Europe who have the digesterone, which is the dufestone, as you see in the slide, this is by far, by so much research, more effective to prevent miscarriages and to stop the bleeding. So when we have the dufestone available, this is definitely the best progesterone we can use, and we should prefer to use the dufestone. Dufestone has also a practical, easier use. It's a pill, and we can use it. We need the dosage usually three a day, which means one every eight hours. So dufestone, again, is one of the most effective methods today from progesterone when a woman is pregnant to stop the threatened miscarriage and to prevent bleeding, to stop the bleeding, and as well, even just because she had in the past miscarriage.
So we continue with this. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to come back to all the questions in the Q&A. Just I want to run quickly because time is running out. When we see a woman who has challenges of Harris Mishpacha, once we have today this research, and we know that there are usually going to be underlying issues, and there are over 25 different medical conditions that could be the cause of staining of irregular bleeding. It does not require that every woman who has a light staining should go into the doctor to endoscopic gynecology, making a stroscopy. No, we are allowed, and this is actually something which was a whole talk from Dr. Scott Chudinoff and his team and quite a few other doctors now in the latest ACOG conference, where they presented this concept that we can do what we did now in COVID with telemedicine, that we started actually to treat first-line medication. Instead of working backwards, rule out, rule out, rule out, we were focused on five to eight visits just to ultrasounds and astroscopies and blood work and everything till we ruled out every, every other reason until we treated the medication. Now we can actually do the opposite. And we understand as we did in the COVID, they presented research that was very super effective that we were treating women with first line medication to stop staining and bleeding in AOB. And if it wasn't effective, only then to bring them in to do the work up the investigation slowly to get to the bottom of it. So we don't have to anymore start right away with doing major investigations. So here's the line why we use in Tareno. This is actually published in many papers and it was also mentioned in the talk as I was in the ACOG. It was very interesting to see doctors from Texas and all over the state presenting these solutions that we are actually using for years now in Tareno. Now we have backup research and we see that top experts in the field in AOB are using the same few medications. And every one of you, if you're a rabbi, school teacher, college teacher, can memorize. We talk about five major issues. Of course, we have another 10 separate solutions, which we will not be able to cover right here. As mentioned before, if you want to be an expert, stay with us till the end. We'll discuss our upcoming course. Uh, you can really be trained in a couple of months. You will know all the ins and outs as we do in Tarain. So you'll be a top expert. But this one is the first line. First line, everyone can know, and we're going to give it uh, the full information here. One medication is the, called the HSN. That is a progesterone that we can use either to control cycles to push up or actually to make more Tahara days by pushing up, like a woman has a copper IUD, when she has sometimes a shorter cycle, we can gain tahara days with this, with the agestin. A woman who is nursing without contraception, she can use agestin if she has staining issues. With the agestin, one agestin, a woman nursing woman, she can continue like with this for many months. So the agestin, norcisterone is the same thing. That is a very effective method. This is using progesterone. Okay, this progesterone can help in many, many cases, or with one, or with two, or with three. In other words, five, 10, 15 milligram with the agestin can be a solution for women who struggle with stainings with mini pills, women who just struggle with staining bleeding with, by nursing, women who have issues when they have shorter cycles, women who have issues with the marina. So a lot of issues can be solved with the HST. However, one medication beforehand, which we don't need a prescription even, is the Advil, what we call it the NSAID. NSAID is a facial medicine which is made to use for AUB, abnormal uterine bleeding. Not only the CDC is recommending, but in this conference now in ACOG, many lectures mentioned the NSAIDs to be one of the most powerful and effective methods to stop staining and bleeding. What is the dosage to use for the Advil, which is ibuprofen? There are different protocols, but the basics is to use for five days up to 500 to 600 a day. Okay, so you can see here in this slide that some doctors go up to even 700, 800, and even more of, of uh, the Advil a day, and it's very effective. So the right dosage, of course, when we want to go high dosages like 500 milligrams twice or four times a day, we need to discuss it with a doctor, but the basic to use three Advils a day for five, six days, this is really ideal. The way to use it, what we know from research and our recommendations is to start with day two. The medical recommendations is from day one. We recommend in Tarina, our experience to start day two, go for five days. If someone has stainings in the Zynekim, when she makes the Badikas, she can ask permission from the doctor, maybe even to continue at the same dosage or a little bit lower to go even until after mikvah with the Advil. So this is a very effective method for women who are nursing, women in the older age, women younger, nothing to do with hormones. It's just ibuprofen and it works fantastic. Then we have a very powerful medication, which is not over the counter. It requires a prescription, but it's super, probably the best, strongest, powerful medication. And that is the Lestida to stop heavy bleeding. Someone should be able to make hepsic power in time. So either if she has any conditions like endometriosis or just for any no explanations, we don't know, but a woman cannot make hepsic power in time, can use the Lestida, the dosage is approved FDA is six a day for five days. Again, they recommend to start day one. We recommend an experience, our experience in Tarina to start day two for five days. We know a lot of doctors in the States, experts are using it actually in the lower dose till after mikvah. So they use the full dose till the heavy bleeding is over. And then they go in a low dose till the staining is over. Some doctors are using this Lestida also for women who are on copper IUD. This is the official 
guidelines approved FDA for copper IUD was causing heavy periods. Most women with copper IUDs do not make FCR day five. Some of them day six, some of them day eight and nine. We can and they should use Lestida to stop their bleeding. They can make FCR in time. Then we have a vitamin. There are many vitamins. We have the best experience with this vitamin, bioflavonoid, B-I-O-F-L-A. V-O-N-O-I-D, the bioflavonoid for 3,000 milligrams a day divided in the morning in the middle of the day and the evening. We have very good experience. We're using, we are recommending women to use this as a first line together with the Edvol for every staining. Bioflavonoid with Edvol, this is our first bandage. And as mentioned before, we don't have to rush to the hospital every time for any staining. We can start with the first line. If it doesn't work, and then to continue with the other medications or to, of course, look into it, making ultrasounds, making sure there's no other problems or with the hysteroscopy. So as we see here, if we want to go in a little bit deeper when we see the medications don't work, so we have here the major tool, which in the last five years, more than before, it became available. Yes, in the last decade, this is a revolution that AAGL in the States, which is the American Society of Minimally Invasive Gynecology, is really putting forward that every single gynecologist eventually and every expert in the facility should have this tool in their office. Because when we have hysteroscopy, we have the video inside the uterus. We can not only do diagnostic hysteroscopy, but today also office hysteroscopy, outpatient, see and treat. You can look at it and treat it on the spot. And of course, if we still have the surgical hysteroscopies, they can help us with so many issues, removing polyps and other issues. For example, when we talk about remaining products of conception, we can solve these issues with the hysteroscopy without having major interventions. So yes, if a woman is after a miscarriage or after giving birth and she has problems with the house, we will also start try maybe with the bioflavonoids, the, the, the Advil medications, but very soon we will send her to do an ultrasound and even better right away in hysteroscopy if available, and I would highly recommend for all the leaders in our communities, it's rabbis, doctors, and other community leaders, please make sure we have this hysteroscopy service available. Very handy, very easy access in our communities. Very few of the Jewish communities have it at the moment really uh, uh, handy. In Yerushalayim, this is probably one of the best cities when it comes to hysteroscopy, available for free every week with uh, easy access to these technologies, office outpatient. However, in many countries, including in the States, it's available and in many other places, not in Jewish areas, they have it even more available. I think we need to make a change. We need to bring this in in our community, every medical center, from New Jersey, Lakewood, to Brooklyn. Of course, now in Bar Park, when we have Dr. Scott Chudnov leading Maimonides, OBGYN, he made a major center of this hysteroscopy, so we can use it. But anywhere in the world, from Australia to LA, from really everywhere, we need to make sure we have this service. Hysteroscopy should be the basic tool available in our communities for Taras and Mishpachim. Just less than two weeks ago, there was a conference in Spain led by one of the Israeli experts, Professor Chaimovich. And in this conference, as you see here, they presented a new technology, which was about to be announced from the AAGL to replace the DNC. DNC is a procedure which is available for over hundred years. And a lot of people with the DNC, after a miscarriage, to finish up a miscarriage, were actually getting more harem when it came to the problems of the harem mishpocha. Because when we do a DNC, as you see here, blind DNC, okay, less than 50%, of the uterus can be taken care, can be seen, can be really removed. Less than only 40% of the placenta remnant will be removed with the blind DNC. Now, this is really very difficult numbers. But even if it's not so accurate, we talk about a, a procedure which is, was definitely in the last couple of years, the AAGL and many other medical societies against to do the DNC. Now, unfortunately, for all the years that the AAGL had research to show and prove the DNC is causing problems of bleeding in AOB and of secondary infertility of miscarriages, we had no other solution. Now, for the first time, we have few companies who came out with this TRS, the tissue removal systems, that they have a combination, but they have also the DNC, also the stroscopy in one device, one machine can do both. We, in other words, we don't do any more blind DNCs, we do video DNC. So we see what we do. And then with this, we only touch the tissue of the embryo. We do not scratch the whole lining from the whole uterus. So we don't do any more harm for the uterus in general. Let's continue in the next topic, and this is going to be major innovation, which happened in the last year, especially in the last couple of months. But we'll start with a topic, it's called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, we know that PCOS is very, very extremely common. Not only is it a common problem, some claim it's 20% of the community which is suffering from this, some claim other numbers, but one thing for sure, that this issue of PCOS is causing irregular cycles for women, short cycles, women who are struggling with skipping periods, infertility issues, kaharas mishpocha issues, they all come from PCOS, one of the main causes for female infertility and for AUB. The same woman who has part of her life skipping periods and a lot of kaharas days when she has the PCOS condition 
can have the, actually the opposite and will struggle with the problem of very short cycles, of breakthroughs all over the place. Now, there are two groups in the PCOS. We, we know that they have not ovulation. They don't ovulate, but two groups. Some of them are overweight. Some of them are not overweight. The group is overweight. We have a recommendation from 2018 from the PCOS consensus guidelines that they need first-line medication is to go on diet. And if they cannot lose weight, they should combine the metformin, which will help them to lose weight. But the idea is really, there's no specific diet as they published in their book of the PCOS, but we need to be careful, even 5%. And, you know, I was a very interesting lecture in the ECA conference, which a professor presented the idea that people hate to go on diet, specifically the group of PCOS, because they always go on diet and never lose weight. And it's very difficult for them when the doctor will present that a solution for fertility challenge is going to be on diet. They know it's just pushing them away. So the solution is to talk to them, not about diet, but rather to reduce 5%. No BMI, no getting, losing weight, no diet. All we need is a little bit, few months with doing some exercises, using metformin. Of course, yes, with the diet, dietitian preferred, they will lose this 5%. It's not a big deal. However, for the woman who cannot lose the 5%, even with metformin, and this is a very big crowd, until now, the solutions were to use infertility treatments, including the letrozole or in the past, the uh, other medications, Clomid and so on. If it, she did not respond or she did not get pregnant, we upgraded her to injections very soon because a lot of people with a PCOS, even by using, of course, Clomid or, or, or injections, but even letrozole, sometimes either not responding or when we go to high dose, responding and getting hyperstimulation. So we had no way to balance unless we went for the IVF. So we take out all the eggs and there's no problem with hyperstimulation. But so we ended up, and this is the situation today in the States, that a very big part of the group of PCOS end up doing IVF. IVF is a great infertility tool for those who need it, but it's a very painful tool because it's a major project, also financially, also physically, and also, of course, halucha. It's a, such a major stress for the couples to go through IVF. If there is a way we can help the couples get pregnant naturally, not only we gain in the halucha preference, not only financially, many more couples will have many more children because they will be able to afford it, which they don't at the moment, but IVF. Organizations do not sponsor more than one or two children. We're not gonna sponsor 10 children, 10 IVFs. The pain of the roller coaster with doing IVF is tremendous. It's unbelievable, unbearable pain. So when we can now have a solution for those, this group of PCOS, and instead of using this tool of letrozole, clomid, gano, with the IVF, with the IUIs, the ICSIs and the PGTs, we're gonna focus on natural solutions. Here we go. One is called the New European Research. Okay, this is the spymet. We're gonna speak about the spymet in a minute because this is really the biggest breakthrough in the last history of PCOS, in the last 100 years. Before we go to that research, I wanna just share with you what in the last two years, doctors, gynecologists, endocrinologists around the world in the States and the conferences for the ASRM and others presented new solutions to PCOS for women who are overweight. The solution is really to help them lose weight. And the way we're going to do it is not to tell them just go and diet, use metformin, because metformin will only work for a certain amount of women. So if they are doing well with metformin, yes, of course, it's the easiest, cheapest way. But if not, don't schlep around months or years. Rather, switch your medications so they can actually lose weight. And we talk about medications, the new medications, which in the last two years got approved FDA for overweight people, including the uh, Zempic, the Govi, this is very effective medication. Now, Vibovi is the main medication injection approved in the FDA. NHS in the UK not only approved it now this year, but actually made it available for free. Anyone in the UK overweight can get Vibovi. In the States, unfortunately, a lot of the, the insurances, or most of them do not cover it yet. So it's super expensive. It's a month, about $1,400 to $1,700, the Vibovi. But in this case, we can use Ozempic, which is the same medication. It's also an injection once a week. It's not the same high dosage. It's not going to be the same strong, the same powerful, but it will be very effective. However, very soon, probably the Govi will be covered everywhere in the world. And this is going to be the ideal way. In the meantime, our experience in Tyreno, we're using a Zempic every day. Women are losing weight with using this Zempic. There are different mechanisms, four different mechanisms why women are losing weight. Just a week ago, a week and a half ago, the FDA approved a new and maybe better injection for losing weight. Monogera, if I pronounce it right. This is a new injection that just a week ago was about it was announced in the, in the medical papers and everywhere that FDA approved this for being an other injection. And some claim that this is a combination of two medications, which makes it even maybe better or more effective to lose easier weight quicker. So if we talk about someone, we can use it by the way for, any, for everyone who's overweight. Well, now we focus for fertility or Tahara due to PCOS. And we want to minimize the side effects of PCOS. We can use this injections for women who are overweight. Now we go to the real stuff. This is women who are not overweight, who have PCOS, that the Europeans proved in the last year that they came up with a new medication 
cure PCOS. Again, to cure PCOS, not to manage the symptoms, but rather to get rid of PCOS. I know this is very big. It sounds an ambitious goal, but this PIMED, you can look it up, this PIMED research, phase one is done. Now we are in phase two, and nine different countries, the EU invested 6 million euro in 19 different centers where they try now this PIMED. This is a combination of three medications that we have available. So any doctor in the States, if it's legal for you to use these medications, I believe it is, the combination, we can try it out. It's medications which we have available, and they at the moment focus on young women up to the age of 25 to try to cure, yes, to cure the, the PCOS. Okay, so this PIMED, if you live in the countries in, the, in the Europe that we have it available, please, you can definitely join the groups of research and you can cure for your daughter, for your family member, your community to cure PCOS. So we're getting into a new level of treatments and PCOS women, which is today a very large group of people who need the IVF, they're not going to need any more the fertility treatments because we will be able to help them by just curing, okay? So we're going to actually cure the PCOS, having natural cycles, natural ovulation, natural children, natural pregnancies. But now we're going to the next major topic, which in the conferences in the last year was a very, very big uh, issue. That is the AMH. AMH today in all the countries around the world, it comes in as a very big predictor. When someone has an irregular cycle, we just mentioned PCOS. We need to be careful that AMH should be checked to rule out and to confirm PCOS or to rule out POI, primary ovarian insufficiency. Because the AMH is a blood test that we can do any day in the month. And we can see, as you see in this slide, where she is up to. You can see here, a woman, when she is born, she has 1.5 million eggs. When she is in the age of about 15, there's only around 300,000 eggs. At the age of 30, 180. At the age of 40, 45, which is only 30%. So the AMH level will depend on the ages of the woman. And when we test the AMH, it's a very simple blood test, which in most countries in the world, it is actually covered. In some countries, it's not covered, but it's worth it the money. Okay, it's worth it the money to actually use this test to predict the, what is their egg reserve in this woman. What is this going to help us? If she has PCOS, it's, it's going to be a high dose of AMH. If the AMH will be a high level, more than the average, we know she has PCOS, then we know that it's okay. We don't need to do any major drastic things. However, if she does not have so many eggs and she has actually a low ovarian reserve, it comes back, the AMH is very low, depending what her age is, what is going to be considered low. But if she has a low AMH, then we do need to do action. The number one is, well, we need to plan if she wants to have a big family, and most couples, Baruch Hashem, want to have big families, whatever big family means by them, four, five, six, seven, eight, 12, 15 children. But the idea is that they need to plan accordingly. They cannot make spacing. The AMH by the age of 22 is 1.5. They know after the first baby, once she is okay, she needs to move on. There's no time. We need to rush. That is number one. Number two is that even more important is that they need to be educated about the options. What can we do if someone has this condition of DOR, POI, POF, very similar, maybe some medical uh, uh, light definitions, what is different, but the bottom line is all of them have a problem with their AMH, very low egg reserve. So the good news is that we have today available also in the States, a very few places in our main Jersey and other places in Manhattan. It comes from Spain, originally actually from um, uh, uh, Greece, where they have the PRP. We have it also in Israel now. PRP is a plasma, the platelet-rich plasma for some women. Of course, not everyone, when they're going to take out the plasma for the woman, two hours, four hours, clean it, inject it back in the ovary. That will help us to get out some cells, some eggs, follicles, which otherwise will be no way to bring it out. So even if someone is, unfortunately, MH zero, we need to try this method before we go with the party or any other uh, uh, not ideal way. So the PRP is, things got a major breakthrough. It's better than an IVA operation. It's successful, but not too much. Very super expensive in Europe, seven, 8,000 euro. You know the prices now in the States are just becoming available because it was research, was it for free or cheap? And now it's going to uh, be out of research, will be very expensive. But the PRP is a solution for someone who's already zero or next to zero. However, if someone is re realizing beforehand that they have a lower AMH, the solution really is that we need to do preservation. Preservation in general, when we talk about low AMH, will be to fertilize eggs. We talk about married women that will be fertilized eggs to have IVF and to put it in a freezer. If she's not married, if she's a girl, and for some reason the, the cycle gets irregular, we check the AMH. If it comes back one or less than one, we probably want to consider it with a doctor, with a rabbi, to do freezing. In this case, we'll do freezing, egg freezing. It's also very effective. Unfortunately, we need to use this technology all the time for cancer patients and for other patients who have different conditions. So we know the technology works. So the AMH is another reason why, a low AMH, why we should do freezing. Okay, so the, the answer is we want to really focus on 
helping people having big families. And this is not gonna be by just rushing one other child because if someone has AMH 0.8, yes, they can have maybe one other child, two other children. No one can guarantee that in five years from now, we don't still have ability to get pregnant. But if we do the freezing, we can guarantee that we'll have the ability. One thing we need to highlight is that it's not one for one. When we freeze one egg, it does not guarantee us one child. It's actually very research different depending, it's very complicated calculations, but all in all, it's about 10 or 11 eggs for one embryo for one baby, live bird baby, or three, four embryos for one live bird baby. So when someone is freezing and it has frozen three, four embryos, that's not enough for another three, four children. We need to freeze 10, 15. So it's sometimes when the AMH is low, she's not anymore responding so anymore, she's not developing so many eggs. So we need to do it time and time. It's very expensive. But when we do it in time and we see that the woman is POI, it goes down, we don't have to wait till the last minute, then we can freeze easier, cheaper, more effective, more quality, and so on. So, if you mentioned the female fertility preservation for medical reasons, of course, we're going to mention also older girls over the age of 30 should consult with their rabbis and their doctors who said to do the freezing. And the idea would be because at the age of 35, the quality goes down. Having it in a freezer does not mean we're going to have to use it, but it gives us the a comfort and the, the guarantee that this couple, this, this woman, this girl will be able to have a big family on their own without major challenges going through IVFs maybe later in the age of 40s, not so successful because the quality will go down by the age. So having freezing is not only for medical purposes, but also for social and other unfortunate cases when women and girls are not yet engaged, you should be aware that it's available, this technology. And by the research in the last year, so many conferences focused that it's not only any more legitimate, we should recommend for this. And from the Halucha perspective, Nashkofa perspective, of course, everyone will speak to their own rabbi. I believe that most rabbis will approve. We should do this and actually encourage that people should do it. Men, male, uh, Preservation, unfortunately, needs also to be done when there is medical reasons. And what I want to highlight, not only by cancer patients, but also, unfortunately, if for sometimes people who unfortunately have very bad semen analysis should consider with a rabbi doctor also to do preservation to freeze sperm or to freeze embryos. One major breakthrough in the research published this year, which the research started a couple of years ago and by the ASRM in the States, the ASHRAE in Europe, but now the WHO, which is the, organization, the World Health Organization. They are in charge of the guidelines, what we should check in the sperm. They added in their new, the sixth edition, a new check, which is the DFI check. This means that we should recommend couples to look into check DNA fragmentation. And most clinics are not doing it yet. Everyone will eventually do it. It is a very good and important factor to look into. So besides the regular test, the most common things where we focus always was on the count, morphology, motility, and many others, but this was the three main things. Now we have another major thing. We want to focus on the, the DNA fragmentation, which means that the, the sperm can be broken. The DNA from the sperm can be broken, fragmented. And if it's fragmented over 30%, that is a problem. It can also cause miscarriages. It also cause infertility issues. So when it causes male infertility, male miscarriages, we need to focus on the male to, this is a real new game changer that it's not only the focus miscarriages, only the female part, but actually if someone has miscarriages, we should look into the DNA. I'm not going to say every rabbi will give a heter to do a semen analysis after one miscarriage, but probably after two, three, four miscarriages, everyone with their definitions, we should consider to do this test, the DFI test. And if there is something we see here in this slide, we have many solutions, including starting from natural solutions, including vitamins. Yes, some of the solutions will include medications and operations. Some will include to do the IVF with some techniques to choose the sperm, which is not fragmented. But there are solutions, so it's worth it to do it. Going further to the genetics, mentioned at the beginning that we have today the pre-implantation genetic testing. So we know for many years, the PGT, or we used to call it a PGT or the PGS, now it's called the PGTA, PGTM, PGTSR. Now we are familiar with those three groups because we're using it every day. PGTM is probably the most common for families who have problems, carriers of conditions. They need to choose a healthy embryo, so they do an IVF, and then they actually make a biopsy to choose to make sure it's a healthy embryo. However, the PGTA, very, very, too much common in the States where we check most of the embryos to know which ones have a healthy chromosome. In other words, the chromosomes should not be affected. PGTA today by the guidelines, it's not recommended for a woman who are younger than the age of 35. Although many groups in the States, including the RMA New Jersey, Dr. Scott's group, and many others are presenting a lot of data of the benefits of it, but the official guidelines is against it because not only because there's not enough data to, pr to prove it. The fact is there are so many labs and probably 90% or 95% of the labs in the States and, many, and everywhere in the world have also some mistakes for good or for bad. So it could be false positive, false negative. And we also know the concept of self-correction. Therefore, we, the medical guidelines is not to produce, not to use the PGTA method 
in general, unless a woman is over the age of 35 or she has a lot of miscarriages, in certain cases, we will offer the PGTA. Comes to PGTSR, this is a genetic testing that it's important to understand why doctors are recommending so rabbis can be more open minded to this PGTSR. The idea is that when we check the genetics of the parents, we want to know if there is a problem with genetics. We're not going to check for an auditory shorem, other panels of tests. We're looking for something specifically, but if a parent has a problem with that genetics, then we can solve this issue either by just continuing and let them get pregnant, but they can also lose it, or by actually doing an IVF with a PGT. In that case, it will be called PGT-SR. Okay, so that is a very certain test, what we do for people who have miscarriages. This test, maybe we should offer already after two miscarriages. In some places, we'll do it only after three or four miscarriages. This was, and it's still available everywhere in the world. What's new in the field, that is a PGTP. PGTP, that is at the moment available in the States. As you see here, we have already in the world a baby born from the PGTP. And it's very controversial for all of us, rabbis and people in our community. We need to start to think, what are we telling our members in our communities? Of course, doctors and experts in the field should we recommend for this PGTP. On one hand, the dilemma is very, very difficult. We talk about a technology who can save lives, who can help people to live much longer lives. Because some families, we know today that they have in the families in the ages of the 50s, 60s, 70s, cancer, strokes, and so many other medical conditions that we know is genetically, they have genes, they are carriers from genes that are in the 60s, 50s, 70s, they unfortunately are at high risk to one of the major conditions. And we can cure these conditions by doing IVF PGTP. That is different than the IVF PGTM because the PGTM is something which is at the moment unhealthy or a carrier of a major condition. So we know there is a problem. Here we talk about an embryo which is fully healthy. We talk about another 40 years to make sure that it will be preventing all of these major conditions. So I'm not against it. I don't know the answer. You know, it's very new. I think there's different perspectives. Yes, we can save lives. For sure, if someone can afford this, if the rabbi feels that Hashkofa wise, by saving a life, people will be able probably to live much longer. And specifically in these families, we talk about that they have people, unfortunately, who die very early in the younger ages, in the 50s and the 60s, because, because of medical conditions genetically. If we can cure this, it's, of course, a major breakthrough to save lives. However, we need to realize medicine is so dynamic. We're going to have the CRISPR technology and many other technologies, which is going to help us cure so many conditions. So we're not sure the PGTP is the only solution. Therefore, we have to be considering if we should tell couples for sure, not to let them recommend always to jump on something which is super expensive, super complicated, when could be the solutions in 20 years will be so much easier with other IVF. Just food for thought. Another research just published in the last month by the Israeli Society of Infertility was regarding the IMSI. That's a famous Israeli technology of couples who, unfortunately, as, as a spermia, who don't have sperm, who do need to go through microtessa, which is one of the most popular test, uh, uh, operations, Schlegel's method called in America, or the microtessa in professional level. So this method should be combined with the IMSI. The success rate when using it together with IMSI is much higher. And I will add that the MC should be actually, it's also a preventive method before we go for microtessa, because this can be very helpful and to choose the couples to go for microtessa only ones who do not find when they do the MC. Professor Schlegel told me personally, and of course the, the doctors, the leading doctors in this field, Professor Bartov in Petah in Israel and Aaron Peretz, and now we have it also in, in the States, also when Aaron Peretz comes in, and also when we have this Mays Clinic who's doing it in Manhattan, the MC. The MC is an important tool also before doing the operation, but also after. Even people who did not find by Schlegel, by the microtessa, should continue to do the MC once a half year, once a year. And things got, once in a while, we have a case that two years, four years later, we can find some sperm with the MC, even if by the operation it was not successful. One of the technology, which was actually in Baltimore this year, by the ASRM, the leading topic, but the main sessions was called the IVG. I'm not going to speak too much about it because it's not yet available. It's only going to be available in a couple of years. But just to prepare you that we're going into a new generation, that the solutions of fertility will not be any more IVF, rather IVG. IVG, as you see here, in vitro gametes, is going to be creating babies from skin. In other words, even if people unfortunately had cancer or genetic problems, why they were born without any sperm or without any eggs, they will not going to need any more to do adoption or consider asking the rabbi to do a potty hatter. They will be able to have biological parents, logical babies, by using their own skin from the testicle and from the ovary. So this is not yet available, but in a conference, that was in Baltimore the first time they presented that they know for sure this will be approved in the next between five to 10 years, that will be in a clinic approved FDA. However, just a conference two months ago, they presented a group from LA that they are one of the leading groups 
together with the group in Pittsburgh, presented their information, where they up to with the IVG. And in fact, they're already using it in Pittsburgh for people, for kids with cancer, to take off a piece of skin before treatment, put it back with the technology of IVG creating. Before we finish up, V-Patch is an Israeli technology, approved FDA, not yet available. It's in the pipeline of, of uh, will be available later in the year. It's for the first time, a major solution, effective solution for people who struggle with intimacy dysfunction. And now we talk about male intimacy dysfunction. Until now, people who had premature ejaculation had no real solution. The solutions were stop start, which is a psychology. We can educate the brain, try to train in. Sometimes it works, many times not. Here we have a patch, which a person will put on, and that will help with a very interesting mechanism, but it will be very helpful for a person to control, not to have premature ejaculation. With this, I would like to take now the time to answer all the questions. Please, in the Q&A, put as many questions you have. I'm gonna start with questions as they came in. But before we go to the questions, I just wanna introduce, as we saw, thanks God, we have so many new innovations, so many solutions for so many problems today. I would like to invite you to be the leader in the new community to make the change, to make the impact of the couples, to do better. You pass in, you help, you practice, but do it better. Do it with innovation. Get the full information which is available today. And that, this is by taking our Terrain course once a year, only once a year we're offering this course. It's gonna be a live course. Myself, I will give over in 20 hours with the full information, with our experience with the latest innovations in the field of OBGYN, focusing on all the topics of infertility, miscarriages, contraception, tahrism, mishpocha, genetics, and everything in woman's health you need to know. So you can actually be the address for the couples. You don't have to send from Mechel to Rechel. You can hold their hands wherever they have a challenge. You can be the expert. You can communicate effectively with your professional people in the community. If you are a medical expert, you will understand their halucha and society needs. What are their complications? What are their needs? How to communicate? How to help them and to bring so much more simcha to so many more couples. So yes, please look forward for your information and your emails about the upcoming course, which we're going to start next week, Sunday. It will go for 10 weeks, every week, Sunday, two hours. You'll get a full booklet of 70 pages of the slides of the, of the, the presentations. Of course, you'll also be able to call me, speak and ask live the questions, and as well to call me after. Hopefully, to, you should graduate to be the part of Tyrenu in your community 